This week on Wealth Track, financial thought leader and University of Chicago finance professor Lubush Pastor has a shocking message for investors. Stocks aren't necessarily best for the long run. Oh no! It isn't so. Professor Pastor and his controversial research are next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market, Wintergreen, your home for global value and Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. We are on Wall Street today at the Museum of American Finance. It is the only museum devoted to the history of finance, the core of our free market economy. Well, this week we're examining one of the bedrock ideas of personal finance, the thesis that over the long term, stocks are safe and rewarding investments. Now, just about everyone agrees that stocks are volatile and risky over a time frame of five years or less, but widely accepted academic and Wall Street research has shown that when you hold stocks for 10, 15 years or longer, the risk of owning equities shrinks and the rewards remain large. That is the contention of Wharton professor Jeremy Siegel in his classic study, Stocks for the Long Run. Siegel looked at stock prices and returns in the U.S. stock markets going back to the early 19th century. According to his research, stock investors earned average annualized 7% total rates of return. That's with dividends reinvested. This bullish analysis of equities has survived even in the aftermath of the financial storm of recent years. Target data life cycle funds are constructed around the idea that stocks are less risky and deliver consistently rewarding returns when held for long periods of time. But along comes a young University of Chicago professor who has studied the same historical stock data as Jeremy Siegel and has reached shockingly different conclusions. According to Professor Lubosch Pastor and his co-author Robert Stambaugh of the Wharton School, the further out you go in time, stocks become more volatile and thus more risky. According to their research, the consistent 7% returns over the past 200 years are an historical fact but not a guarantee of the future. Investors looking ahead over the next several decades face all kinds of uncertainty. And as Pastor points out, uncertainty compounds with time. Professor Pastor teaches finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and earned his PhD at the Wharton School where Siegel teaches. Lately, he's gotten a lot of attention for his research on the stock market and asset management. He's received several top awards from the financial industry, as well as awards for teaching excellence. In a recent interview in Chicago, I asked Lubush Pastor why we should rethink stocks for the long run. Well, the idea of stocks for the long run rests on two main pillars. One is that the average return uh, of those who invested in the stock market has been unusually high on the order of 7% per year in real terms. And the other pillar is that the volatility of stocks declines over time as your investment horizon increases. I have problems with both of those pillars. So, so let's talk about the returns, which because there are many models that we are shown that guarantee us practically that we're going to get, you say, 7% real returns. And, and I would say, you know, they, they talk about 10 to 11% nominal returns. Why are those suspect? Well, they did happen in the past, uh, but there's no guarantee they will happen in the future. In fact, I expect the average return in the stock market to be lower going forward than what we have seen over the past couple of hundred years. Why? The most important reason, in my opinion, is that we got lucky. We got tremendously lucky over the past couple of centuries. Imagine someone sitting there in 1800 or 1900, doesn't matter. Uh, could that investor have reasonably expected uh, that the United States would become the world's biggest superpower, that the U.S. would win World War I and World War II and the Cold War and avoid the, uh, the nuclear missiles that Khrushchev sent to Cuba and uh, 
not to descend into socialism as many other countries have. This is all good news. These are all good things that have happened and they prop all uh, equity returns upward. Going forward, it's going to be harder to deliver these positive surprises. Uh, once you're at the top, it's hard to, to rise even further. You know, you bring up an, an interesting point, actually, because we talk a lot on WellTrack about global investing. It's no longer U.S.-centric. And so, in fact, the statistics that we're, that we're looking at that, uh, that have delivered the 7% real returns over the last 200 years are all based on major U.S. stock, a major U.S. stock market and markets. So, in fact, in a global environment, that, that adds a, an entire other dimension, doesn't it, for, for global investors? It sure does. Uh, I'm a big fan of international diversification and global investing. I will note that, pretty much as you pointed out, if you, if you invested in German stocks or Japanese stocks, you would have been wiped out after World War II. This did not happen in the United States. So, again, there's a reason why the U.S. US stocks have returned a little bit more than, than stocks elsewhere. Now let's talk about the risk, the, the, the second part of the, the two pillars that you disagree with, and that is that, that stocks over the long term really are not that risky. You say they are risky. Why? Well, I have this uh, recent study uh, co-authored with Rob Stambaugh from Wharton in which we question the conventional wisdom that stock volatility declines with the investment horizon. Um, hist if you look backward, look at historical estimates of volatility, you do see strong mean reversion in stock returns. You do see bull markets followed by bear markets, bear markets followed by bull markets, and you do see long-run volatilities of stocks being lower than short-run volatilities. However, we look at this problem a little differently. We, we compute measures of volatility that look forward as opposed to backward. We take the perspective of an investor who's looking into the future as opposed to a historian who's who's looking back. See, an investor who looks forward has to take into account not only the historical estimates, but also the uncertainty associated with those estimates. And once you take that uncertainty into account, you discover that um, stocks actually become more volatile on a per year basis as the investment horizon increases. So you personally uh, have, have reassessed your view of stocks in your portfolio as a result of your research. How do you view stocks? What place do they have in your portfolio? And how should we view stocks in, in our portfolio going forward? I think stocks should remain an integral part of, of any long-term diversified portfolio. There's no question about that. What I've learned from my own research is that stocks are actually a, a more volatile than I thought uh, from the perspective of, of a long horizon investor. So I personally have slightly reduced my own stock allocation. I haven't reduced it too much because of my own personal circumstances. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of human capital that looks like a bond. In that you're my, a tenured professor I'm at the a University of Chicago. tenured professor. My paycheck is steady. So my human capital looks a lot like a bond. I'm sitting on this huge bond investment. Mm -hmm. So any you know modest financial capital that I have should be tilted towards stocks. And th there's a broader point here. I don't think everybody should be investing in the same way. Your circumstances are different from mine. Uh, some people's human capital looks a lot more like a stock and they should tilt away from stocks in their financial portfolio. So, so, so uh, for instance, I mean, I mean, whose human capital, whose job profession looks more like a stock? Take an investment banker who will get a huge bonus in a strong stock market when deals are getting done, uh, but who might get fired in a, in a bad market when, when no deals are getting done take an entrepreneur. Uh, these are examples of jobs that uh, do not provide a steady stream of income. Uh, th this income is highly correlated with the performance of the stock market. So if I were an iBanker or if I were an entrepreneur, I would be even more cautious with my stock allocations. So, so let me ask you about the risk profile of stocks. And so, so what you're saying is that, that stocks are more risky than the conventional wisdom, as, for instance, uh, you know, published by Jeremy Siegel at the University of, of Pennsylvania at Wharton. How are stocks risk profile compared to other financial assets that we can invest in? So our research focuses specifically on stocks. Mm -hmm. We chose stocks because that's where we are able to question the conventional wisdom. We do not analyze bonds, nominal bonds, for example. That would require a different set of analytical tools. However, I do believe that some of our ideas would also 
make bonds look more volatile in the long run. This is, uh, these are conjectures, but I believe that as long as you're uncertain about future inflation, that's going to make bonds uh, look more volatile as well going forward. Uh, we do have some prescriptions, though, in terms of uh, portfolio allocation. So, for example, suppose you're investing over 30 years and you're deciding between two assets, the stock market and a risk-free asset, which over 30 years, I suppose, would be TIPS, mm -hmm. Treasury Inflation Protected Securities with 30-year maturity. In that case, um, what I would do is, is, is reduce my stock allocation and, and shift some money over to TIPS. So, so let's talk about the target date funds, uh, because some of the target date funds have actually, uh, when you near retirement, they actually have still have a pretty hefty percentage of the, the target date portfolio invested in stocks. And because of the attributes that I that I've mentioned, is that you still need a growth vehicle for 20 or 25 years of retirement. So, do you, you agree or disagree, or what's your view of what sort of allocation you should have in retirement to stocks? I personally would be a little bit more cautious with my stock allocation at age 65 when I might retire. Um, because at that point, suppose I commit to retirement and I will never work again. At that point, my human capital is zero mm -hmm. for all practical purposes. I'm not going to generate any more paychecks after age 65. So it's going to be harder for me to make adjustments at that point. I will not be able to postpone my retirement anymore. It's going to be harder to, to cope with the risk involved in stock investing. So I would prefer my, my investment to be lower than, say, 35 or 40 percent in stocks, which we often see at retirement in these target date funds. What I would also uh, like to do after I retire at some point, hopefully far down the road, mm. um, is maintain my stock allocation reasonably stable over time. I would not want my stock allocation to continue declining after retirement. Right. So, so, so this idea that, that your age should equal your, your bond allocation, if you're 75, you should have 75% in bonds, 80, 80% 80 in bonds. You don't agree with that. At, at some point, you have it level out at what level? From? I agree with that advice yeah. uh, before retirement because younger people have more human capital than older people right. for that reason. But after we retire, the human capital is off the table. Human capital does not change between ages 66 and 76. So after we retire, the only justification I see for this declining glide path that you're describing is, is mean reversion and stock returns. And, and again, uh, I'm not a big fan of that argument based on this research that, uh, that we recently did. So if you're 80 years old, how much, how much should you have in the stock market? Just the average person. You should have something in the, in, in the stock market, if anything, for diversification purposes. But I certainly wouldn't hold 40% of my wealth in stocks, 10, 20. Right, but it should definitely decline with age and then have a constant bit at a lower level than we probably have been advised to in the past. That's what I would do, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, let me ask you about diversification because you just mentioned it. Uh, that's another investment mantra is that you should be broadly diversified, that it's going to protect you uh, in, in the, you know, event of financial crisis or recessions or whatever. And as we all know, that it did not protect us, except unless you were in cash and gold in the financial crisis. So what's your view of diversification now? How important is diversification for most of our portfolios? Despite the financial crisis, diversification remains important. See, it would be naive to think that diversification can protect you from, from all kinds of accidents. Uh, let me give you an extreme example. Suppose our planet gets hit by an asteroid. <laughs> Correlations will go to one. Okay, that's pretty clear. Right. Now, suppose we get hit by a really serious financial crisis, as we did in 07, 08. Correlations will go to one. That's not surprising. But diversification does help smooth things out in more normal periods. I mean, think of it as a seat belt, for example. You put on your seat belt. It um, makes you safer in many accidents. It, it'll protect you in many accidents. It will not protect you in really big ones. So let's, let's talk about illiquidity, because uh, you have some uh, lessons from the financial crisis uh, that I'd like to ask you about. And one of them, of course, is liquidity risk, uh, and which is liquidity just completely dried up uh, during the financial crisis. And there's also something called tail risk that we are, you have been familiar with for, for many years. But those of us uh, who are, are not in your position as a professor at the University of Chicago didn't really pay much attention to tail risk. 
uh, which, which means these, these on, on either end of a spectrum, these uh, very unusual uh, events that can happen either on the positive side or the negative side. We went through negative tail risk. So, so what were the lessons that you learned from the financial crisis? Oh, certainly liquidity risk and tail risk I, would be very high on my list. Uh, let, me, let me begin with tail risk. Mm -hmm. So yes, people underestimated tail risk uh, before the financial crisis. Post-financial crisis, people pay a lot of attention to tail risk. And as a result, insurance against tail risk is extremely expensive. We cannot all buy insurance against tail risk. For every buyer of insurance, there is a seller. So if we all want to buy insurance against tail events, we're going to end up paying a lot. Uh, the price will skyrocket as it has. To some extent, the high levels of gold that we see are can be viewed as, um, I mean, there are other reasons, but gold is also a good diversifier in times of trouble. Gold can be viewed as insurance against tail risk. Perhaps that's why investors are willing to pay much for gold. Perhaps that's why investors are willing to pay so much for T-bills. Um, they are also a good diversifier in times of trouble, good insurance against tail risk. Do, so, I, do you think they're worth the price? Not to me. Not to me, which brings me to my, my key point. In my opinion, whether or not you should buy insurance against tail risk depends on your own personal profile. If you are in a good position to bear tail risk, if you're a deep pocket investor or if you have stable income, you should not be buying insurance against tail risk. You should be selling that insurance because you're getting compensated for for this um, for providing this insurance. You're getting compensated much more handsomely than you would before the crisis. So this is something that I don't see appreciated very much out there. Everybody talks about tail risk, how we have to adjust our portfolio strategies and pay more attention to these tail events. Well, if you buy insurance against them, you're going to pay uh, a lot. That's going to be reflected in lower returns going forward. Uh, if you're Warren Buffett, if you're a deep pocket investor, well diversified, you're probably better off selling insurance against these tail events, especially today. Liquidity. What are the lessons that we should take away from the financial crisis about liquidity or lack thereof? Well, liquidity can dry up and investment strategies that try to exploit the illiquidity premium get hit especially hard. So is there still a lot of systemic risk to liquidity drying up, do you think? or I mean, We're hoping that we've learned our, our lessons, at least the institutions that had the issues with liquidity that they've learned lessons, but, but is the risk still with us? Uh, I think so. I think so. It's very difficult to predict liquidity crises. It's, uh, it's not much easier than predicting earthquakes. Liquidity crises and earthquakes are sort of similar. They're very hard to predict, and when they hit, they hit hard. Uh, what we can do is position our portfolios to be prepared for the next liquidity shock. Even if we can't predict it, we can manage the portfolios so that um, uh, the portfolios drop in times of liquidity crisis is not, is not too heavy. And, and how, do, how do we do that? How, how do we protect our portfolio or against liquidity? Well, uh, we, we would want to uh, stay away or reduce our holdings in assets that fall the most sharply when liquidity dries up. I would call these high liquidity beta assets. And, and those are? And those are bank stocks, uh, junk bonds. Um, you can measure these sensitivities mm -hmm. to, to liquidity shocks and you can sort assets based on how sensitive they are to liquidity fluctuations. As far as active versus passive management, we've had a number of people on WealthTrack, uh, you know, uh, Burton Malkiel, for instance, the random walk down Wall Street, uh, Charlie Ellis, who wrote, you know, Winning the Losers Game, who are very uh, firm advocates, proponents of index investing, because they feel uh, that their research has shown them and their experience has shown them that, that the active managers cannot outperform the index over long periods of time. What's your view of the, in the active versus passive debate? Having looked at the data myself, I, I agree with those who find that most active managers have been unable to outperform passive indices. Um, roughly two thirds of active funds underperform passive benchmarks. And the one, over time? Over time. And, and the one third that outperforms varies from one year to the next. It's really hard to pick the outperforming managers. So if you're picking at random, you're likely to be better off with a passive index. Now, having said that, I do believe there is some talent if you have access to the top managers, if you are David Swenson of Yells Endowment and you have access to the top private equity funds, 
to the top hedge funds, I think you can beat passive indices. It's just that very few of us are in that position. I also believe that there is some talent, there is some skill in active management. You're more likely to find it in the neglected and less liquid asset classes. You're small more, cap. Small cap, private equity. You're more likely to find it there than in, in the most liquid asset classes, large cap or treasury bonds. So your advice then to individual investors who wish to be invested in the markets is to do index funds? If you can get access to top performing managers, and if you are pretty sure they are top performing managers, go for it. If you're not in that position, and most people are not in that position, I would go with index funds. Why is finance in investing the one area where we can't excel, we can't beat the averages consistently? Because markets are awfully close to efficient. I Th see. They're not perfectly Fairness. efficient. You have superb hedge fund managers who right. find inefficiencies. From their perspective, markets are not efficient. From the perspective of the average guy out there, the average right portfolio manager. Even, in other even words. the average active from the perspective of the average mutual fund manager, say, markets are awfully close to efficient. Right. People so their try. playing field is so efficient that yeah. there's no way that you can beat it consistently. Moreover, moreover, the average investor holds the stock market. There's no way around that. Yeah. Each stock out there is held by someone. Right. The average investor, if 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 we were to put together all of our holdings and, and put them into one person that investor would be holding the, the value-weighted, diversified stock market portfolio. So if Bill Miller tilts in the direction of value, somebody else must tilt in the direction of growth. If I tilt in the direction of small cap, somebody else must tilt in the direction of large cap. Otherwise, things wouldn't add up. Mm -hmm. So given that the average investor holds the market portfolio, for everyone who outperforms, there must be someone who underperforms. Mm -hmm. so, Why do so I have to be in that, <laughs> in that group? So then you have to ask, you know, active versus passive. The passive, passive guys pay very small fees. If I'm a passive investor, True. my fees are 10, 20 basis points. Right. If I hire an active manager, I'm talking about 10 times, 10 times higher fees. It's uh, pretty much a zero-sum game. So if I'm in a zero-sum game, I prefer paying lower fees. Yeah. I think it's as simple as that. Okay. So, no, that was very succinctly put. So the real proof in the pudding is always what you're doing with your modest investments, as you put it. Are you indexing or are you in active, investing in, with active managers? I am indexing my, my modest uh, financial portfolio. All right. So, so you're definitely you're following your own advice. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, we always ask everyone this on WealthTrack, and you actually have an unusual one. Yeah, it's hard for me to give uh, financial advice. I don't follow large cap, small cap, et cetera, value versus growth. Um, I've mentioned human capital uh, earlier, and I believe that investment in human capital is particularly important these days. Investments in financial assets, wherever I look, I see low yields. I see low yields in bonds. I see stocks being sort of pricey. I see commodities being expensive. I look at human capital, and I see... I see high returns with very little downside risk. If you invest in your education, for example, especially as a young person, you're getting a high expected rate of return with virtually no downside risk and potentially huge upside risk. But let me ask you about that because, for instance, if you go to college or if you get a graduate degree, uh, most students' parents are unable to afford the very high price. So you end up being indebted. I mean, some students are graduating from graduate school with hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar debts, you still think that that is a good investment? I believe that it's a good investment, especially for the very top schools. So uh, due to globalization, we live in a society where income inequality is higher than ever before. Uh, this is a society where there are billions of people in emerging markets, China, India, elsewhere, willing to work hard, willing to join the, la the, the global labor force. You have to compete with them. You need something that they don't have. And top-level education delivers, delivers that, delivers skills. You can get unique skills that you can't get elsewhere. So invest in yourself. It's probably a very good piece of advice. So Professor Luboch Pastor, thank you so much for being with us on WealthTrack. We really appreciate our conversation with you. Thanks for having me. Financial thought leader Luboch Pastor, it is definitely worth following his advice and heeding his groundbreaking research. The next couple of weeks are fundraising periods for many public television stations, so be aware that WealthTrack might not be seen in your area. 
However, for those stations that do show us, we will be revisiting our exclusive interview with an investment legend, small stock investor Chuck Royce, founder and portfolio manager of the Royce Funds. Meanwhile, to see this program again, please go to our website, wealthtrack.com, for a podcast or streaming video. And while you're there, check out WealthTrack Extra, where you can find complete extended interviews with recent guests, including our TV exclusive with retired PIMCO great investor, Paul McCulley. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us. Don't forget to take a moment on Memorial Day to remember the men and women who have died in the service of our country. We owe them so much. Make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market, Wintergreen, your home for global value, and Rosalind P. Walter, 